Welcome to another day in Kuala Lumpur. It's about one o'clock in the afternoon right now and it's a pretty hot and muggy day. And I'm heading to a special area of Kuala Lumpur called Kampong Baru for a five snack challenge. I've never been to uh, Kampong Baru before. Uh, the name actually means New Village and it's kind of an odd name when you think about it because it was officially founded I believe in 1899 or 1900 so the Kampong Baru itself dates back uh, about 120 years and I'm sure people were living there many many years before that so it's hardly a new village they should call it uh, Old Village and that's kind of the idea, I guess. It was founded as a farmer's enclave for the Malay community in Kuala Lumpur. And ever since it was founded, they've resisted development. So you have traditional Malay houses on stilts and very little development. You see skyscrapers all around this area, but right in the middle, apparently, it's still like a traditional a small village, so it should be interesting to see. Kampong Baru is not a large area. It's about four square kilometers, and it sits right across the Klang River from KLCC. So you get a nice contrast between the traditional homes and the traditional markets with the giant skyscrapers of uh, the Petronas Towers right behind it. I don't know whether 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock is the best time to go to uh, Kampong Baru. Um, I know they have a, a food street there that uh, gets quite busy at night. That might be a better time to go. But I'm uh, here in the daytime and uh, so I thought I'd go check it out and see what's going on. And of course I'm at the Pasar Seni LRT station and I can head straight to the Kampong Baru stop and be there in just a few minutes. said to be very valuable since it sits in the middle of uh, Kuala Lumpur city itself, like right in the heart of downtown. They say it's worth up to 1.4 billion dollars and developers have tried to buy up the land there, but the elders of Kampang Baru have resisted those offers because they want to maintain the traditional Malay lifestyle. I've arrived at the uh, Kampang Baru LRT station. It's pretty quiet here. I don't see any other people at all. And I just noticed on the signboard here, they have a listing for the food street. I think Lorang Raja Muda Musa is the food street. And I'll probably walk down that street in search of my five snacks. The five snack challenge, by the way, is just a little game that I invented to force myself to try some of the local food. And the idea is not to look for the specialties or the famous dishes. The rules of the game are that I have to have at least five snacks or drinks before I go back to my hostel. And I look for, I don't look for food, it's just whatever happens to uh, catch my eye. If I catch myself sort of looking at something and wondering, huh, what is that? Then the rules of the game are that I have to try it. So we'll see what I stumble across. I should invent another game where I have to say hello to every kitty cat that I come across. Hello there. Are you okay? Oh, what a pretty kitty. Oh, there you are. Oh, nice. Nice kitty cat. Nice healthy cat. A young, young cat. Might be pregnant, I think. I think I feel some uh, kittens in there. I remember reading that there were a lot of uh, cats in uh, Kampong Baru. And so far, that's turning out to be true. Okay, 
This is kind of interesting, considering the buildup of a traditional Malay village and small houses and that sort of thing. When you step out of the uh, Kampong Baru LRT station, you see anything but that. <laughs> this is what you see when you step outside. Check out uh, on this side. Massive apartment buildings all being built. Yeah, they're all under construction. And then if I turn my camera in the other direction, now you're looking off towards uh, KLCC, Petronas Towers, and all the other huge buildings over there. So, so far, I don't see a traditional uh, Malay village. This is a modern Kuala Lumpur in uh, all its glory. There's no end to the construction. Even behind these apartment buildings right at the front, there's another set of them being built back there. And if I'm properly oriented with my internal compass, I think the heart of Kampung Baru is actually in this direction. So the development is uh, closing in on this area. I came across a snack number one, I think. I've been hearing about this. Um, it's called Apam Balik. It was one of the first things I saw here in uh, Kampang Baru, so we're going to try one of these. Here they are here, all ready made. Uh, looks like it's uh, kind of like a pancake. So what are these called? Yes. What is the name of this? Apam Balik. Oh, okay. What is uh, what is it that you make it with? Instant sugar, sweet. Say that again. S sweet. 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 Okay. Sweet corn. Oh, okay. Sweet corn. Oh, sweet corn. Okay. It was made with nestum and sweet corn. So I got six apam balik. I didn't really need uh, six of them, but I'll save uh, some for later. I'll try one right now. Though I have my usual problem of how do I eat these while holding the camera, you know? <laughs> I have to put the camera down somehow in order to uh, get one of these out. <laughs> I have the uh, camera set up on its tripod now, and I'm having my apam, apam malik. And I thought there'd be um, like a lot of filling inside. I've seen some other ones that were much bigger, like a thick pancake and had a lot of filling. But these are the very basic plain ones. The very thin uh, pancake with nestum and sweet corn inside. Hmm. And sugar. I can taste the sugar right away. Oh, it's good. It's a nice snack. You know, no big surprises here. It's like a very crunchy, crunchy uh, crepe with uh, corn, sweet corn inside. I don't really know what Nestum is, to be honest. I'll have to go take a look at that package again. I haven't had any breakfast today, and I haven't had any lunch, so I'm, I'm pretty hungry, as you can probably tell. That's uh, kind of my secret to not getting horribly fat. I often skip meals, um, just out of laziness, I guess, and I'm not really that interested in food, which is why I have the five snack challenge. It makes me be interested in food. <laughs> I'm so hungry. I'm gonna have two of them right now. Mm kind of nice because when you're eating from the outside you're kind of getting plain crepe or pancake and then you hit the middle you're not expecting it and you hit the sweet corn and you suddenly get a burst of new flavor so yeah good snack thumbs up 
think I found snack number two. Here on the food street, I think it's uh, very easy to find five snacks very quickly, so I'll probably have to pace myself. But right after the uh, little pancake stall, um, I saw this new little tent here, and it has some really interesting little snacks there, bright colored green and red and yellow. And on the sign it says, Thap Thim Krob. It is just too delicious. I have no idea what these things are that could be uh, too delicious, but I'm going to uh, try one. Hello, how are you? Wow. This one looks uh, quite challenging. And that. Oh, that's durian. Ah, yeah. oh, okay. So it's a seri muka durian. What's that? Three, three ten ringgit. Three oh, ten three ringgit. for ten ringgit. Oh, okay. Okay. And kui nona manis per perawan seri muka pandan nyonya. So here it is, snack number two. I think it was called Saramuka Durian, or Saramuka Durian Special. And it uh, feels quite heavy. I think it's some kind of a cake made with a durian topping. So let's check it out. So these little stalls at the side of the uh, street don't have a uh, seating or chairs or tables or anything. So I mounted my camera on a little uh, parking block or something, and I'm trying my uh, durian cake. I've already forgotten the name of it, uh, the Malay name. It's very heavy, very thick. Whoa. <laughs> I don't think I can have all of this at once, because if I do, I won't be able to eat anything else. Kind of like the uh, durian ice cream that I had before. It has kind of a uh, a light flavor of durian, not too strong. You know, it's not overwhelming. I guess I'm still cheating because I haven't had actual durian yet. I'm building up to it. You know, durian ice cream, durian cake, and then someday we'll have actual durian. See how that goes down. And all these shops are torturing me because everywhere I look, there's a Manga Susu stall. Manga Susu there. Some kind of drink shop over there. Another Manga Susu there. And I'd love to have one, but um, I already had one as part of the previous uh, five snack challenge, so I can't uh, duplicate myself. Mm. But I could really go for one of those. <laughs> Maybe I'll have one later, after the uh, five snack challenge is complete. When I was online this morning, I found this website from uh, Kuala Lumpur Tourism Office, and they produced a walking guide to Kampong Baru. It has a list of all the things you can see and do here, and they have a nice map um, which shows some of the historic buildings here. You can see the map here of uh, Kampong Baru, and uh, following this map, I'm going to walk down towards the end of the food street, and there's supposed to be a set of three historic buildings there, and one of the buildings is called Matt's House, and it's the original home of quite a well-known teacher at an English school, and I assume his name was Matt, and uh, members of his family still live there. So let's go take a look at uh, Matt's house. This is the street sign for the food street, Jalan Raja Muda Musa, and I'm standing right beside the gated entrance to Kampong Baru. But I think Master Matt's house is uh, down in this direction. Uh, when I talked about it before, I forgot to mention that its full name is Master Matt's House, not just Matt's House. 
he was a teacher after all. They had to call him Master. I'm in the neighborhood where Master Matt's house is supposed to be located. I haven't found it yet, but maybe there isn't even a sign for it. Um, if a family still lives there, you know, why would they put a big tourist sign on the front? Um, but there are a number of uh, traditional looking homes right around here, like uh, right in front of me. And there it is there. You can see the house uh, sitting on uh, stilts. And this uh, traditional home has seen some better days, as has this car, as has the poor uh, rental uh, bicycle. Stairs leading to nowhere. I saw a lot of similar houses in uh, Cambodia and they built it up on stilts for the rainy season so that the uh, flood waters would go underneath the house and not flood it. And they often in the villages they had animals uh, in stalls underneath the house there. Yeah, I saw similar structures all over Asia really. In the Philippines, in the mountain villages, I saw houses like this. And they were interesting because they had little trap doors in the floor of the rooms and then they could just open this trap door and toss scrap food down into the uh, down to the ground underneath their house and that's where all their uh, chickens and other animals were waiting and getting fed down there. So it was always interesting to uh, stay in those houses and then you can hear all the animals down below, you know, eating and making noises, doing whatever animals do. Of course here in the big city we don't have animals anymore. In fact, uh, the person living in this blue house has parked his uh, brand new and fancy Mercedes out front. So it's a, uh, a different world in uh, Kampong Baru today. Silly me, I just checked my map from uh, Kuala Lumpur Tourism and I think that is Master Matt's house. And did I call it Master Tom's house before? I feel like I did. And if I did, that was a mistake. It is Master Matt's house. I wonder uh, what the current residents of the house feel having their house uh, as part of the uh, walking tour of Kampong Baru and people like me showing up every day with a camera. Who knows, maybe they don't mind. I wasn't looking for it, but I stumbled across another building on the walking tour. There's the Kalab, Kalab Sultan Sulaiman. And it is kind of a social club for the residents of Kampong Baru. And I guess it's been here for a, a very long time. And outside of the building, I found this sign for the uh, cultural guided walking tour of uh, Kampong Baru every Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. I guess you meet here, 4.15 to 4.30, and then you go out for a two and a half hour walk around uh, Kampong Baru. I don't know if they're still doing it or not, but um, this is what I got my map from, and they still have a sign for it, so maybe they're still doing it. This is the third building that's indicated on my map for the walking tour. And it says that it is some kind of a gallery or museum showing the history of the political struggle in Kampong Baru dating back through the colonial era and independence period. But looking at it from here, it doesn't look like it's uh, operational anymore. I don't see uh, anything to indicate that it would uh, be open or still have a display inside. I'm back on the main food street again. And I think I'm going to turn snack number three into a lunch. And I think that counts as a snack because I was just walking by this restaurant behind me there and I see that they are advertising nasi lamak, which I think is the national food of Malaysia, if not one of the national foods. So I'm gonna go in there, order a nasi lamak and see what I get. What is nasi lemak? What is it? It's coconut rice. Oh, coconut rice. Yes. And does it come with anything special or just rice? <laughs> we use santan. 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 Okay. 
Expo. Could I have a Nasi Lemak? And there it is, Nasi Lemak. Looks pretty basic, which makes sense. This is kind of a uh, fairly basic little restaurant, nothing fancy. Rice and a sauce here. I have no idea what this sauce is. Hmm. It's actually quite good. I had no idea what it tastes like. Couldn't tell you. I thought it would be like really strong, and it does have a, a pretty strong flavor, but it's not overwhelming or anything. Yeah. And it comes with uh, cucumber. Maybe the cucumber is santan. I don't know. But I'm not tasting any coconut at all that I'm aware of. Maybe that sauce is coconut sauce? But it doesn't taste like coconut to me. So, I'm just as confused as I always am. And this is the place where I'm having my uh, nasi lemak. As you can see, it's uh, fairly quiet right now. I think at night it gets a lot busier. And they have kind of a buffet style there. You can serve yourself a lot of different dishes. So that was my snack of Nasi Lamak, snack number three. The uh, name on the restaurant menu was actually Nasi Lamak Biasa, and I don't know if that makes any difference. And again, uh, when I asked the guy about it, he talked about uh, coconut flavoring, but I didn't taste any coconut anywhere. Maybe that sauce is what makes it Nasi Lamak? because the rice itself really was just plain rice. There was no flavoring or spicing or uh, vegetables or anything like that at all. Here is another landmark in this neighborhood, the Masjid Jamak Kampong Baru. I think I came across uh, snack number four. I was just looking across the street and I think they're making uh, like sugar cane juice. And I've had this before, but maybe 20 years ago, literally. So uh, it's practically a brand new snack. <laughs> and uh, hello, there it is over there. Let's uh, try some of this. Where are you from? Uh, Canada. Canada. Yeah. Hey. Okay. So what is this? This one. Yeah. This one, tearing it. Okay. What is it called? Cool. Yes. What is the name? Name? Of this. Uh, I'm speaking the uh, Tabu. Tabu? Tabu. 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 Uh, uh, oh, okay. Um, just yep, one. just one. All right. There it is. There. Ooh. And for me, lo lots of ice. Okay, lots. Yeah. Nice and cold. Okay. YouTube, YouTube. Yeah, YouTube. YouTube. What's your name? Uh, yeah, I can show you. Okay, 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 okay. Canada. Instagram? Hmm? Instagram? Instagram also, yeah, same. Okay. Yeah, same. Same name, the Cycling Canadian. Canadian. Facebook. Facebook? Instagram. Oh. Same, huh? Yeah, same name. Okay, all right, all right. Canada. I, I'm from Indonesia. Oh, Indonesia. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Uh, Bali. From Bali. You. You. From uh, Meda. Meda. Snack number four. Sugarcane juice. I tried to find out the local name for it, but I, I couldn't think of it. Or uh, he couldn't. Uh, I couldn't understand what he was saying. Um, what it's called. Let's see how it tastes. Oh yeah, that's very good. That's a very, I can tell that'd be very refreshing on a hot day. And today's a hot day, so there you go. It's good, uh, good timing to finally have this snack. The young man who uh, sold me this was very friendly and he wanted to chat. He didn't speak much English though, but I did find out that he's uh, from Indonesia. His home city is Madame. I've been to Madan many times, so we were chatting about that a little bit in, uh, in broken English. 
It's funny though that over the years I've had certain foods and certain drinks in different countries and right afterwards I've gotten really really sick and for a long time afterwards that drink is associated with in my mind with being ill and this uh, sugarcane juice I had it I think the last time was in India a long long time ago and right after I had it I became so sick I thought I was going to die and I think that was the last time I had it because deep in my brain I associate this taste with being really sick but I, I think I'll be fine here the, I'm sure the water and the ice is uh, much cleaner than what I had in that small village uh, in India long ago after snack number four of sugarcane juice I'm walking through some of the back streets of Kampong Baru there's a surprising number of uh, vacant lots like this one that I've seen all around uh, Kampong Baru and I imagine this piece of land is uh, quite valuable maybe the owners are hanging on to it for some future uh, date where they can cash in maybe they'll build another one of these giant uh, apartment complexes here and this is probably a very iconic scene from uh, Kampong Baru I can imagine a house like this is something you would commonly see in a village out in the countryside and has an amazing backdrop of all the skyscrapers around KLCC. Something I really like about this neighborhood is that even the tiniest streets have these big clearly marked uh, street signs. That makes it so easy to find my way around. You can see one here and over here is another one and then another one. It's just so rare to see uh, street signs almost anywhere in Asia. So to have this whole neighborhood clearly marked like that, it's kind of cool. I think my time in uh, Kampong Baru is coming to a close and I still have snack number five to take care of. And I might have found it. I was just walking through some of the back streets of uh, Kampong Baru getting kind of a contrast between the old houses and the new skyscrapers and they came across a satay restaurant. Was this a satay? Satay, yes. Uh, what kind of, is it uh, chicken? Chicken and beef. Oh, chicken and beef, oh, okay. Come in and take a look. Uh, smells good. Smells good, yeah. So all of this, is it uh, chicken or beef? All the chicken. All chicken? Yeah. Okay. And does it come with a kind of sauce? Yes, gravy with a uh, peanut. A uh, peanut sauce. Yes. Okay. And just seating uh, in here? Yeah. Okay. Could I have, um, I don't know, maybe four? Four, okay. Yeah, okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. So he has some uh, chicken satay, and uh, I ordered four sticks along with uh, peanut sauce. We'll see, uh, see how that tastes. I think it'll be pretty, pretty good. And look who I found at my table. Big, mean-looking tomcat, I think. He's been through some wars, this guy. Big head on him. Wow. Very friendly. Hey, kitty. Oh. Yeah, look at him. Big old tough guy. That's for sure. He probably wants uh, some of my satay when it comes. Oh, look at that. Yeah, I like this uh, little place, or this big place actually. Has a comfortable seating. Nice breeze going through right now. It's nice and cool in here. And I got my big old Tomcat underneath my chair, keeping me company. And I ordered an iced tea to go with my chicken satay. And it comes with a peanut sauce. This ought to be very good. And look at that, looks so good. Milk iced tea. Mm. Oh, I needed that. And guess where my, uh, my friend the kitty cat is hanging out? Right below me. Hey, kitty, kitty. Oh, oh! I didn't mean to. Uh, didn't mean to disturb you.
This place is full of surprises. I wasn't expecting this kind of uh, presentation, but uh, take a look at this uh, snack that I ordered. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? I got the uh, peanut sauce, satay, some onions, cucumber, and he said this was a uh, rice. Wow. Let's uh, dig in. Mm. I'm really uh, getting in the uh, peanut sauce here as much as possible. It is so good. <laughs> that is very, very good. Very soft, very tender. I saw something online about how they <clears throat> marinate this chicken for an entire night, you know, each night before they serve it the next day, so it's uh, nice and tender. One for me, and one for the uh, kitty cat. I finished my meal of satay, and I learned that that uh, rice that I had was called nasi impit, I-M-P-I-T kind of a glutinous rice. That was very good. A nice addition to the uh, satay I am. And the man who cooked it for me said I could come up here onto the uh, balcony of the restaurant and get a nice view of uh, the Petronas Towers and uh, KLCC. And here it is uh, right behind me. Here's the restaurant where I had the satay. He was cooking it over here. And they have a little counter here where you pay, and my table is just down there. You can see my friend, the Atom Cat, underneath the table. And then they have this uh, seating area upstairs with the uh, KLCC in the background there. And there it is, snack number five location, Satay KL. Next door to Sate KL, we have a madrasa over here, and then another empty lot with a KLCC in the background. And that almost brings my visit to Kampung Baru to a close. I'm going to head back to the LRT station, head back to uh, Pasar Seni, and uh, end another day of exploring Kuala Lumpur. Soon though. I'm not going to turn off the camera just yet. Who knows what I might come across between here and the uh, LRT station. There might be another surprise for me. And the more you walk around this area, the more really interesting houses that you see. Like this one here, all made out of wood. And then right across the road, another quite a, you know, traditional roof structure, traditional, you know, small village building. There's a nice shot showing a modern Kampong Baru and modern uh, Kuala Lumpur side by side. It's a good thing I didn't turn my uh, camera off. Would have missed this shot. In these tiny little streets right beside the LRT station, you really get a sense for uh, what makes this neighborhood special. And a lot more of these very uh, traditional houses with narrow streets and always uh, just behind it all I don't even know how much of it is getting in the uh, in the frame all the well, let's move over here Petronas Towers and all the other buildings around KLCC there they are I was taking video of this uh, house but shooting into the sun but now I'm on the other side and maybe you get to see a better image of it, of it uh, just beneath the uh, skyscrapers of KLCC over there. And at the end of Kampong Baru, you run into the wall. And I think on the other side of that wall is uh, either a highway MRT line, LRT line, and then the Klang River, all separating this village from that part of Kuala Lumpur. 
man, this wall is huge. I imagine there must be a uh, highway there, and the wall was built to keep the sound, the roar of the highway from uh, spilling over into this area. Look at that thing. You almost expect to see a Jon Snow here protecting it from uh, White Walkers. You've got the wall blocking your path in this direction. And then the construction barrier blocking your path in this direction. Not sure what they're building. So I guess to get to the LRT, I'm going to have to uh, circle around. Back at that construction site, they had a sign and an arrow saying pedestrian walkway. I wasn't quite sure what that meant, but I found it. And here it is, the uh, pedestrian walkway. Hello. Just follow the pedestrian walkway signs through the banana trees and it should get me a little bit closer to the LRT station. Oh, <laughs> yeah, they really mapped it out. Got another arrow pointing in this direction. Oh, some more birds. Hey there, buddy. What, uh, what's, uh, what's on your mind? What's going on? It's got an interesting uh, mohawk. Oh, and here's the uh, partner. Hey there, buddy. How are you? Are you a singing bird? Do you sing? Sarsini. That's where we're going. And that is it for my day at uh, Kempong Baru. I'm back at uh, Pasarseni Station, about to go back to my hostel. And uh, yeah, I really enjoyed Kampong Baru. It's the kind of place that the longer you spend there, the more you appreciate it for what it is. I think you have to get away from the food street, start walking through some of the back streets, you know, the real residential areas, and then the whole vibe starts to uh, grow on you. The whole sense of being in a, uh, a village from decades ago in, in many ways. And then you always have the towering, Patronus Towers to remind you that no, you're in the year 2019. So it's a very interesting place to go. I think at night it would be very interesting because all those restaurants would open up and I imagine it's uh, quite busy. So if I ever uh, have someone visiting me here in Taiwan and I want to go out for dinner, I'll probably head to uh, Kampong Baru and uh, find one of those restaurants there. So I hope you enjoyed that little visit to uh, a traditional area of Kuala Lumpur, and I'll see you in the next video. The bonus question for the last video was about a piece of street art that I saw in Kuala Lumpur. In the street art, you can see Mr. Meeseeks plus two other famous fictional characters. I asked you, who are the other two characters? Answer? They are Darth Vader from Star Wars and Magneto from the X-Men. Bonus question for this video. Kampong Baru was formed by combining a number of traditional Malay villages between the Gombak and Klang rivers. 
How many villages were brought together to form Kampong Baru? Put your answer in the comments below. Answer at the end of the next video. Travel tip 33. Walk away from the airport. This is a tip for the low budget backpacker. Like landing at an airport in a new country can be a really stressful experience and it's tempting to just hop in a taxi and be driven right to your hotel. And there's nothing wrong with doing that, that's fine if you have the money. But for a budget backpacker, a taxi fare from the airport can put a huge dent in your budget, especially if the taxi driver takes advantage of you and charges you a lot more than the local regular fare. These days you can take Grab or Gojek or Uber from the airport, and that's usually cheaper than a taxi, and it's a little bit more under your control but it can also be quite expensive and as I learned in uh, Bangladesh recently the chaos around the airport means it can be really hard to connect with your uh, Uber driver there's so much traffic and so much going on there that the driver just can't find you and, and you can't find him so sometimes even that isn't an option so my tip is to just start walking there are often layers of transportation at airports. Uh, the very first layer, you know, just as you come out of customs and immigration, will be taxis. Taxi drivers will be waiting for you the second you emerge, and these guys are usually the most expensive option. But if you keep walking, you'll get outside the airport building, and there you'll find more taxis and maybe hotel shuttle buses and other options, and these are still relatively expensive, but if you keep walking even further and follow some of the local people, you might find yourself at a regular city bus stop for a local bus, and that bus will take you all the way downtown for next to nothing. Even if you don't see a local city bus stop at that point, you can just keep walking. Just walk into the city and keep going until you come across a bus, any bus, just hop on it and see where it takes you. In Bangladesh recently I met this uh, British backpacker who does exactly that all the time and he did it in Dhaka in Bangladesh. Instead of taking a bus or Uber or Grab from the airport, he just walked out into the city until he was far enough away from the airport that all that stress and confusion and pressure was left behind. He found a little stall where he could sit down, have a drink, relax, catch his breath, and then when he was ready, he got up and hopped on the first bus that he saw. And he could do this because he had a phone with GPS. He had a general idea that he wanted to go to downtown Dhaka, so he got on a bus that was sort of heading in that direction. He didn't know it was going to go all the way to downtown, but he stayed on that bus and tracked its progress on his phone until it started to drift away. And then he just got off the bus, chatted with some local people, got some more information, and then he hopped on the next bus that kind of got him closer to his destination. And he just leapfrogged his way all the way downtown by local buses. And this is a great way to do things, assuming you have a relatively small backpack, you don't have a real uh, time commitment, and uh, in his case, he didn't have a hotel booked. He was an old school traveler, 
and he did it like we used to do it in the old days, where you had no way of booking a hotel in advance. So you would just go downtown where you knew all the budget hotels were, usually around the bus station or the train station, and then you just walk from hotel to hotel until you find one that you liked. So, if you want to save some money and you're open to a little bit of adventure when you first arrive in a new country, don't hop in a taxi, just walk away from the airport and see what happens. You might find a city bus right away, and if not, and you're feeling adventurous, just keep walking and hop on a bus, monitor your progress on your phone, and uh, you'll eventually get somewhere where you can find a hotel. And you'll have a great story to tell at the end of it.